All right, here we are, and it's time to take a look at, no, not, 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 I want my pen, pen back. Race and attractiveness. I added this section to my lectures on uh, physical attractiveness uh, based on, first off, recognizing that there's really not much in the normal literature or the standard literature that's taught about uh, racial differences in terms of attractiveness. And also, uh, students would ask me about it. And so, uh, these topics were suggested by students, and so, uh, you know, that's the genesis of this part of the lecture. So first off, uh, let's go back to Cunningham. And I told you that he used, uh, and Cunningham's study is a classic. It's really famous. Uh, I remember back in, in uh, graduate school in 86 when this came out, it was immediately super famous, and it's always been so. Uh, however, you, you may want to take a look or reflect on this. They had 75 male undergraduates, okay. Uh, you know, they were psych students at Elmer's College. Uh, what's Elmer's College like? Well, I took these screenshots from their web page. And uh, you can see that the majority of the students there are white and middle class. And so does that have anything to do with what Cunningham found? Eh, probably. Uh, so. Uh, why is this the case? Why, and this is not an isolated case, uh, a lot of the research on race and attractiveness, or a lot of the research on attractiveness, is just done on white people. And so why is that the case? And there's a couple reasons why that is the case. Uh, the first is, you know, uh, ease. Uh, the big research institutions usually have more white than black students. Uh, you know, these big research institutions, to be big research institutions, have to be large universities, large research universities. Uh, and usually, uh, you talk about the land-grant universities. Uh, so, uh, University of Ohio, you know, OSU, Ohio State University, uh, Michigan State, where you know, Robert Zions was, uh, and uh, University of Minnesota, uh, University of uh, Nebraska, all these big research schools were land-grant universities where, uh, you know, the uh, state is committed to supporting the university, and the university is for the entire state. And uh, those states are more recently uh, you know, settled uh, because the land the land grant universities were when the states were being settled, and they decided to you know give money the grant land to a university, not just to build the university, but they would grant land to it to uh, fund the university. They would use the land or rent it out or sell it to you know fund the university. So these universities in the Midwest are a little bit at a uh, you know advantage economically uh, than universities in the east so uh, you you have more white people living in the midwest and so you have that bias already and then when you have a bunch of white subjects in your research pool it's just easier to go to your research pool and say okay we're just going to do this experiment with all white students or you know, mostly white students. Uh, that's easier, but it's not better. Because, remember we've talked about external validity. External validity is when you can generalize the results of your study to other frames, other people, other settings, other times. And the only way that you can guarantee external validity is having examples of the frames you want to generalize to in your study. And so, without, uh, with only white people in your study, you can only generalize to other white people. So it would be ecologi uh, externally, excuse me, externally invalid to generalize uh, to uh, African Americans if you have mostly white people in your study. Uh, so, uh, where's the research on African Americans then? Well, 
we have to really talk about, and this will be my last chance in this class, so I'm going to do it, talking about the, the power of systemic racism, uh, we can ask, where are all the black social psychologists? And there's really not that many. And I'm not saying that the only way you're going to get research done on issues about black people is by black psychologists, but there certainly would be a better representation of research about black people if there was more black people in social psychology. And the answer about why there's not that many black social psychologists is going back to syst uh, systematic racism. That is because uh, black people earlier on in their lives go to schools that are not, uh, not, you know, elementary schools that are not as advanced as the elementary schools that white students are going for, going to, those black students start out disadvantaged and then they go to high schools which really aren't that great. And so already you're starting to see uh, a distinction between white and black people in terms of who are going to have the pre preparation to go to graduate school. So that's why you don't have that uh, as many as you would want black researchers in the field. Also, where is the money for research coming from? Uh, it comes from grants. And grants are not you know, devised by researchers themselves. Uh, they are uh, given by people who have lots of money. And who in America have lots of money but white people? And so generally white people will give research to uh, researchers who are more interested in you know, doing research on other white people. Uh, I said that kind of wrong and it's kind of crass, uh, but the idea is that it's going to be generally more likely that money coming from wealthy white individuals will go to things, uh, research that concerns them, and not to research on uh, why black people are underrepresented in America or why, uh, how do black people differ in terms of white people uh, in terms of how they uh, view the attractiveness of other people. And then there's the systemic bias in social psychology itself where we see black per people as a problem and not the norm. And I'm drawing quotes around problem because we can say this about how social psychology or psychology has treated uh, other, uh, you know, uh, disadvantaged uh, groups such as women. For a long time in psychology women were treated as the other and as a problem and they considered men to be normal and any way that women differed from men was considered to be a problem with women. And likewise uh, we're, we see in America white people as the norm and any ways that black people or uh, you know, people who are not white differ from white people. We see them as different or as a problem and not the norm. And so as long as psychology uh, thinks this way about race, then there's going to be systemic differences in how much research gets done on, uh, you know, white people and African Americans and also the types of research that interest white people versus that interest and are important to African Americans. So we can talk about some the you know examples of many interesting studies uh, conducted on African Americans about attractiveness and I would be remiss uh, or really uh, you know uh, you know, tone death if I didn't really include one of the classic studies in social psychology on attractiveness and African Americans. And this is the Clark's doll studies. Uh, Mamie Clark was the uh, originator of, her, of this idea. Her master's thesis uh, was the first time that she studied this, and one of the first times this was studied. Uh, after she got married, her husband, uh, who was also a psychologist, uh, began working with her on her project. Uh, not to say that he was not a great uh, psychologist in his own right. Uh, he was the first uh, tenured African American uh, at CUNY, uh, and he was also the first African American president 
of the American Psychological Association. But it was Mamie Clark uh, who originated the idea. And the doll studies are essentially summed up in this photo, uh, which is from the 1940s in one of their studies, uh, which is they ask African American children uh, who they'd rather play with or what they'd rather play with, this doll or this doll. And uh, so here is a current example of a recreation of a doll uh, study from the Clarks. Which doll is the black doll? And which one is the white doll? Which doll is the pretty doll? Which doll is the nice doll? Which doll is the bad doll? Which doll is the nice doll? And which doll is the bad doll? And, wh and why is that doll pretty? Because she's white and he has two eyes. Which doll is the ugly doll? Why is that doll ugly? Because, he, because he's black. Which doll looks most like you? Yeah, which one looks like you? And that one. Okay. So, wow. Uh, this is, uh, you know, very heavy, uh, to use the vernacular, uh, but shocking and disturbing. Uh, that is in terms of their doll preference. And the Clark study is mainly about doll preference. Uh, but when you're dealing with developmental psychology, and looking and when you're dealing with developmental psychology and looking at children uh, you really have to focus on what the doll means to them it's something that is their possession but it's also a representative of a human being uh, and here we see that uh, among african-american children there is a strong preference uh, to prefer a white doll over a black doll. And let me first uh, be specific about what I mean by a strong preference. Uh, here we have a table from like a 1960, early 1960s study by the Clarks. Uh, and this study has been redone since the 1930s uh, many, many times over. And we see that again, uh, and this is just uh, all African American subjects. Uh, the African-American subjects, not totally, but there was a marked preference for the white doll over, oh, here's the percents here, sorry, the white doll over the black doll. That is, uh, the black children wanted to play with the white dolls more than the black doll. The black children felt that the uh, nice doll was the, uh, black, uh, was the white doll. Uh, they felt that the black doll looked bad and that they felt that the black doll did not have the nicest color. So this has been a disturbing uh, phenomenon that we've had in psychology up until today. And, oh, that's the mailman, but he's just going to leave it, so I'll try to finish up this section. Uh, it's really been you know, what, uh, you know, 80 years of trying to figure out what this means. Uh, the one thing over the 80 years is it's pretty stable. Uh, however, even back in the 1950s and 60s, the Clarks noticed some very interesting differences. Uh, that is, uh, in terms of skin color, uh, African Americans, uh, you know, uh, who had uh, the most uh, let's see, light skin uh, uh, were, mo were the most likely to want a white doll over a brown doll. And those, ooh, what was that? And those, uh, you know, children who had dark skin had a lower preference for the white doll over the, uh, you know, dark doll. So there are differences in terms of uh, skin color. And then under north-south differences, and 
this was only due to the fact that it was the 1950s or 60s. What they found was that in segregated schools, there was a less pronounced preference for the white doll uh, in black children than in desegregated schools. And, uh, you know, what this indicated to some people was that in the segregated schools, the black children were being uh, encouraged to uh, affirm and support their blackness. And this caused during the 60s and 70s the Black is Beautiful movement where black people attempted to very explicitly create situations and teach their children that black is beautiful. It had some effect on doll preference, but not that much. Uh, so uh, that, the Clark study, is really an enigma uh, in social psychology. Uh, you know, it's been a constant for 80 years, and it really shouldn't be. Uh, why has it not really changed that much? Uh, the study, you know, asks more questions than it really gives answers. I'll try to tie some things up later on, but, you know, if researchers who spend their lives doing this can't come up with a good answer, then I'm not going to do it this afternoon. Uh, but let's move on and look at some other areas that students were interested in and I also thought were interesting also. Uh, and so these other areas are going to be the other race bias, uh, race phenotypicality bias, and body dissatisfaction. And it will add to our confusion and maybe our understanding of the picture. Uh, first off, I want to say that other race bias is not really an attractiveness issue, but a face topic. And students usually ask me about this, so I'll go with it. Uh, students often ask me about race phenotypicality bias. And then also, because I'm talking about race phenotypicality, always want to end up with body dissatisfaction because that at least gives an idea of the most clarity to what's going on. So the other race bias. Uh, don't hear it that much often, uh, but when I was a teenager, uh, white people would talk about how black people all look alike, or people talk about how Asians look alike, or all you know people of other races look alike. This is what we mean by the other race bias. That is that uh, we are uh, at a bias or at a loss of identifying people or distinguishing people of a different race. And a lot of research generally, ha relatively, has been done on this. Uh, Messenger and Brigham in 2001 uh, looked at 91 studies to do a meta-analysis. And so here we have another meta-analysis where you're statistically combining different studies, in this case 91 studies on the other race bias. And they concluded that all of the, you know, that all races showed the other race bias. That is, white people see black people as all looking alike. Black people see white people as all looking alike. Uh, however, this bias uh, works itself out in different ways for different race, races. With your own race, uh, what happens is you have a higher level of hits and a lower level of false alarms. Uh, and hits and false alarms are terms from uh, perceptual psychology, so let me just review them for a minute. When you're doing a memory test, uh, what you're going to do is give people a list of words to memorize and then you're going to give them uh, you know, a list of words and you're going to say, was this word in the list? Was this word in the list? And that list you have is going to have some that were in the original list and some words that weren't. And uh, what could happen is two different things. If somebody says, ah yes, uh, that word was in the list and it really was, so yes, yes, that's a hit in that, yes, they are hitting it on the head, uh, it's a correct decision, they are saying that I do remember that face from the original, or that word from the original set, and it was in the original set. But what happens when uh, it's a false alarm, that is, they say, yes, I remember that word from the original set, but it was not in the original set. And uh, that is called a false alarm, 
where you think you saw that word before, but you were wrong. And you can see how this translates over into identifying faces. You show people a set of 10 photographs, then you have them do something else for a couple minutes, and then you show them 20 photographs and you say, I want you to tell me who was in uh, the original set of photographs. And so what we see is that in your own race, there's a higher level of hits and a lower level of false alarms. So that when I'm looking at uh, white people and white people's faces, I will uh, remember better who was really there in the group that I just looked at, and I'll be less likely to say, oh, that person was there when they weren't. However, in the when you're looking at other races, you have lower hits and higher false alarms. So what that means is, if I am looking at uh, black people, I am going to, you know, not really recognize people that were in the original set. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, oh, that person was there, uh, and I'm going to be wrong about it. I'm going to misidentify somebody. And so uh, white participants, as I just described had a significantly larger or other race bias compared to black participants and this was mainly due to false alarms that is because white people had such a high level of false alarms uh, when looking at photos of black people uh, they had a higher other race bias than black people looking at photos of white people and also the researchers concluded that in studies where there was shorter study time that is when uh, the time to look at the original batch of faces was shorter. This increased the false alarm rate for other race faces. So if I only have a chance to glimpse a black person and then I'm asked to identify them later on, if I only got to look at them for a second or so, I am going to be more likely to say, oh, that guy there, he was the guy, when I'm wrong and that's like an increased false alarm rate. Uh, the meta-analysis uh, concluded a couple other things. More interracial contact decreases the other race bias, and that is because we believe one of the causes of the other race bias is that you need to uh, learn different strategies for telling faces apart. And so, for example, for me to tell white faces apart, I look at noses and ears uh, and uh, you know the eyes and that differs when you want to have strategies for telling black faces apart and so once you get more exposure to a different race you start to naturally develop that schema to be able to I to differentiate faces uh, the one good thing about this is that racial attitudes have no direct effect on the other race bias, that is if you're uh, prejudiced or not prejudiced, that's not going to affect your bias. But uh, racial attitudes probably have a mediating role uh, on the other race bias by way of racial contact. That is, uh, I said before, more contact means less of a bias, but uh, if I'm a white person and I don't like black people, I won't interact with black people, and if I'm not interacting with black people, I don't learn uh, how they'll differ or what markers I'll look for in their faces. Uh, so uh, there's probably a mediating role uh, of racial attitude on this uh, other race bias. One interesting uh, thing about the other race bias, which I think is certainly worthy of discussing, is the typical experiment that I talked about uh, where they show people a set of photographs and then they come back with another set of photographs and say could you identify who was uh, you know in the first set that really does sound like a police lineup doesn't it or some type of police identification program or uh, scheme and yeah so uh, what does that mean about legal implications uh, white participants, oh yeah, this part, uh, I, that's what I just described before, but just imagine this in terms of, you know, 
a legal situation. White participants have a greater false alarm rate than black participants. So that means that black defendants would be more affected than white defendants. That is, if I am a white person and I have been arrested for some crime and there's a witness and that witness is a white person and I do a lineup, uh, that white person is going to be, if I'm truly innocent, that person is going to be unlikely to choose me. But what if, uh, you know, uh, the uh, perpetrator is a, or the suspected uh, perpetrator is a black person and the witness is a white person. Well, the white person will have a higher false alarm rate, which means they will look at a black uh, person and they will identify them. That's the person I saw before and they're going to be more likely to be incorrect about that. That is, uh, you know, white people as witnesses to crimes are going to more likely misidentify black participants, I mean black suspects, than white suspects. So this is one of the most powerful applications I can think of uh, from maybe this whole lecture is that the research is very clear that it's, you know, white witnesses are relatively untrustworthy. Uh, you know, when they're looking, uh, when they're trying to identify black suspects. And more so than white suspects and more so uh, black witnesses with white suspects. So that's a really, uh, you know, powerful statement this research can make. And so uh, here we are at the end of talking about the other race bias. Now let's move on to uh, the next two topics which kind of uh, go together uh, in the next uh, part of the lecture.